Um, welcome. <laughs> welcome, everybody, to Frontline, um, to our very popular event on the US elections. Um, good news and the bad news. Well, the bad news is, unfortunately, Jon Snow and James Nocty were unable to be with us. They've been um, had to catch a plane to Washington at the last minute. So apologies for that. Um, the good news is that we've got somebody that can probably step into both of their shoes. And I'm going to hand over to him just in a minute. You probably know who he is, um, Rory Bremner. <laughs> and <laughs> we're then going to um, go to our panel with our new chair, John Owen, chairman of the um, Frontline Club Charitable Trust, and sit, uh, professor, journalism professor at City University, who will introduce the rest, of the, uh, the rest of the panel. I'm going to hand over. Right. <laughs> 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 Hello, sorry. This, um, this wasn't planned in any way. I, I came to listen tonight, but uh, obviously, as uh, you just heard, Jim Nochte and uh, John Snow have had to go to Washington. Everyone's going to Washington at the moment. George uh, Gordon Brown of, over there last week doing his uh, Tony Blair 9/11. Uh, I'll be with you in, in your in your hour of need. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's his second time he's tried to do that. You remember earlier in the year, uh, Gordon Brown flew to Washington to impress everybody, and it didn't quite work out. He was upstaged by the Pope. Um, which is a bit embarrassing because the Pope was only over there because the Euro is doing so well against the dollar. Um, <laughs> and the Pope, uh, George Bush decided he'd rather have a meeting with the Pope, which would have been great fun to be on the fly on the wall in that one. But so uh, good to see you, John Paul. Uh, no, I'm Benedict. <laughs> what? You're John Paul the third. No, I'm Benedict the sixteenth. No, no, you're just confusing me now. <laughs> okay, so how? So uh, how are you doing, Benedict? How's that lovely wife of yours? Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so uh, Gordon Brown uh, was over there, say, last week. Actually, it was after his conference speech when he, he said, I, I, know, I know who I am, uh, which is great. That's a start. Um, uh, but he had to fly over to Washington because Sarah Palin doesn't have a clue who he is. So, <laughs> so we had to meet the vice presidential candidate, and it's important. But, uh, you know, things are, things are bad back home, and... Uh, just want to tell you, today, Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke have upgraded the credit crunch from Category 3 storm <laughs> to Category 5, which means it's going to affect, uh, it's going to affect folks in their buildings, in their houses. <laughs> I happen to know that uh, the White House itself will be repossessed <laughs> in about three months' time <laughs> by a black guy. <laughs> I thought the whole point of subprime was it worked the other way around. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, in a few months' time, I'll leave the White House, and uh, I happen to believe it's, it'll be the end of an era. I happen to believe it was a great era. <laughs> I know some folks have said they believe it was the greatest era in the history of the United States presidency. <laughs> But you know, I'll be ho handing over, I hope, to a, to a, to a young, to a young, to an older man, <laughs> and John McCain, and uh, and Sarah Palin. I mean, look at that. That together, because uh, him and Sarah, they look good, so so good together. Because she she's in favor of drilling in Alaska, and John McCain's against. He's in favor of funding stem cell research. She's against. He believes in climate change. She doesn't. So uh, it's what you call a balance ticket. <laughs> There. <laughs> but it has, it's, uh, it's been very interesting. And people say, you know, where did she come from? Well, John McCain came to me, he said, where do you think, uh, where do you think Laura says I should look to find a vice president? And I said, I don't know, Alaska. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but she's a good candidate. You know, if you're gonna have a cold war with Russia, you wanna have someone who knows what it's like when it's really cold. <laughs> you know? She lives next to Russia. When did Russia last evade Alaska? Never, not even close. Yeah, you tell that to the Georgians. <laughs> Georgian president, Mr. Mr. Suck is Willie. Yeah. <laughs> See, he's a president, he's Georgian. You vote for John McCain, you can get a president who's late Victorian. <laughs> it's a little English historical joke there. <laughs> but you know, I know there's just stuff about her, pre her teenage pregnant daughter, but uh, that's the thing with Alaska, you don't have to dig too deep beneath the surface to find the crude stuff. <laughs> understand there's going to be a shotgun wedding. Well, that's the whole point. We need to have guns in America, because if you don't have guns in Alaska, you don't have weddings. Let's just be clear. <laughs> uh, it's been interesting all around, of course, the de Democrat side. Uh, Hillary's pulled out of the race, and uh, Bill Clinton is a little bit disappointed. You know, uh, <laughs> 
you know, I was kind of hoping that she would, uh, <laughs> I was kind of hoping that she'd be out of the house for the next four years. Um, <laughs> I'm afraid. <coughs> I, I'm afraid. I'm gonna. I'm gonna have to unpick a few arrangements. I'm afraid. <laughs> so uh, it looks like I'm gonna have to take a back seat in the campaign. But let let me tell you, there's a lot that I can do on a back seat. <laughs> People said in my criticism of Barack Obama that I was borderline racist. Let me just say this: You look around the world. <laughs> you look at the trouble spots in the world. Rwanda. Angola, Zimbabwe. What have those places got in common? A black president. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Look at the name, Obama. That guy is one letter away from being the worst terrorist leader in the... That's all I'm saying. That's... But I know, as Hillary said at the convention, she's going to do everything in her power to get Barack Obama elected. That makes two of us. And I know that given the choice, the Democratic Party chose to go with someone other than Hillary Clinton. That makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be an interesting ride. Let me tell you, the next few weeks could be really, really interesting. So you don't want to hear me rabbiting on. You want to hear somebody who knows a lot more. And I can tell you, Chris over there, who is, you know, the thing about Chris is, he, we call him Chris, but actually, George Bush calls him Keith, am I right? Because he reminds me of Keith Richards, uh, you know, rock and roll guy. And he's been following, and was just saying just now that so many people have this image of Bush as, as a private individual, that, you know, he's a tremendous sense of humor, and, and well, he must have, you know, I evaded Iraq. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, not for them, but uh, for us. But uh, he, uh, so this extraordinary man in his private life, and Chris probably has seen more close up than, uh, than many of us will ever ever like you see of George Bush. Um, Stryker, you may know as the London correspondent of Newsweek, fantastic, up to the minute. Just great. Harriet, <coughs> looking forward to hearing as well. But John is the guy who's got the job of introducing them. I just came along to listen. I'd had two glasses of wine in the bar, and they said, would you just go on stage and say a few words? <laughs> so I said a few words, and if I screwed up, that was entirely in character. <laughs> Now, I hope you won't ask for your money back. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Frontline Club. Again, sorry, John and James are on planes, but we still have a terrific uh, group of journalists to talk about the American election. And we've got all of you with good questions, and I know you want to be part of the conversation. But the first thing we want to do, now that they've been introduced by, <laughs> that was great, uh, Rory, thank you. Um, is, uh, is Chris Morris, who has just really been on the campaign trail. He's been with John McCain everywhere, so many places he couldn't even remember exactly which states he'd been in recently. But we thought to give you a flavor of what's going on on the real battlefronts, we'd see a few of Chris's pictures. Chris, of course, is a internationally um, award-winning photojournalist for the Group 7 and also for Time magazine. So here's a bit of how Chris has seen the campaign. Chris, say a few things, and then we'll go off and running into talking about the momentous events of the next few days and for the rest of the campaign. OK. Uh, first off, uh, it's an interesting campaign, but I've in, in, in American politics, I've kind of been labeled a Republican photographer. It's not, I'm not a Republican. It's just with the Bush, the Bush years were very fascinating. And, uh, for me, uh, it was a very interesting time in American history, so I, I really enjoyed documenting the American presidency. Um, time ended up assigning me to McCain, and uh, <laughs> trust me, it's not as interesting as, as covering Barack Obama. I would love to do that, but they, they basically assigned one photographer with Obama and one photographer with McCain, and we don't interchange. So I've been covering him for basically a year. Um, maybe even a year and a half. A lot of a lot of changes. The last uh, the last month or so, they've uh, the campaign is completely. Uh, they become more ins insular or protective of him. He used to be a lot more open. There was a lot more access to him. Um, now this is Lindsey Graham. I'm just going to go through these, and then, you know, and then later you can talk about some because. Um, um, 
for this. Here's an example. <laughs> this is the campaign plane, and the press is in this back area, and then the front area. And it used to be, and they call it the straight talk. The bus he used to always be on was called the Straight Talk Express because he used to always sit with the media and talk with the media. And now his handlers, he, 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 they never see him. The media never really gets a chance to sit down and, and talk with the, the senator the way, the way they used to. This is out at their ranch, Cindy McCain. And over the years, I've become quite close to the family, and they've given me really good access, and uh, they've treated me like family. And, and, but all that is in the last two weeks has come to an end, and their campaign manager is named Steve Schmidt. They, they basically took all my access away, and the reason they did it was because I represent Time Magazine. And they actually, a quote was them that, look, we cannot reward Time Magazine access anymore because of, uh, they feel that the Time Magazine and a lot of the other American uh, media is out to destroy destroy him. They really feel that they're backed into a corner, the McCains, by the American media. And uh, so uh, basically not getting the same. This is all at his ranch in uh, Sedona. That's a ranch? <laughs> well, they call it the ranch. It's a, they call it a ranch. It's, it's kind of like Bush's, Bush has a ranch. It's not, they're not really like working ranches. This was an area in the front on the other side of the curtain. It was originally, the plane was configured where McCain would sit and have his daily talks with the media. They did maybe one or two of those and they've never happened since. It's, uh, and a lot of his handlers that now work for him are, are, are people that were in the Bush administration. I would say 60, 70 percent of his inner circle that I see around him are Bush people, and especially Palin. All the Palin staff are are Bush White House people that have left the White House in the last few months and are helping, helping with the Palin end of it. This just kind of gives you a style of my photography. This is at a fundraiser in Beverly Hills. And it's funny, they attacked Obama for raising, you know, the Hollywood. But two weeks before Obama was in Hollywood, they were in Hollywood, you know, trying to raise, raise money. This is recent. This is uh, it looks like a day or two before the convention. This is Brooke Buchanan, his like handler. And it's funny, this far along when they travel, this is just shot from the road. It's the America landscape. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can talk to me while I go through these, and then. Uh, and it really changed early on. This is uh, one of the first events with Palin. Uh, covering McCain, you would be lucky if you got 200 people. I mean, a size like this for a McCain event would be normal. And the week of Palin, it went from 200 to 20,000. I mean, just the phenomena of, of Palin, it was amazing. Can you tell me, did John McCain choose Steve Schmidt, or was he chosen for him? I think he was chosen for him. I think the Republicans were worried. I don't, I don't know that as a fact, but I think Schmidt was brought over. And there was some, early on in the campaign, Rick Davies here used to be the, the head of the campaign. Mark Salter was his chief of staff, and that's his, the gentleman who's written all his books for, for McCain. Um, and there used to be a guy, John Weaver, and John Weaver was forced out and Steve Schmidt came in. And it's basically kind of the style. Basically, it's like, look, Senator McCain, if you're going to win the election, you're going to have to play like this. This is how, this is how these are the, what you're going to have to do to win. This is interesting. This is the day of... Uh, that's Schmidt, isn't it, right there? Yeah, that's Schmidt, and that's with Palin feeding the baby. This is the day they announced. And that's her husband. In the and you know, it's shirt. ironic. I'm, the, I'm sitting on this little, like, there's like a little breakfast table there, and there's this, the Palin kids are next to me. And 
the, the girl that I was next to it turned out to be the pregnant daughter and the next day I never even took a picture of the kids <laughs> <laughs> the next day it turned out that it was released that one of them was pregnant and I was sat next to her for like two hours and I never even took a picture of her <laughs> they're actually they're nice they're friendly they're, basically she really is is she's like a mom you know it's not a, you know just this whole kind of uh, you know, you, when, you, when you're in the White House and covering Bush and you deal with Cheney, it's not like this, like, so polar opposites of a Cheney character. But Sarah the access Palin. to her was completely controlled, obviously, in the time. That, what there. happened with me there that morning, when the day they announced, they, they wouldn't, they actually let me stay b backstage and stuff. They wouldn't let me photograph because of Time magazine. They were so angry at Time and not wanting to reward Time. But I've been with them for so long. They said, look, you can stay back here. You can watch. You just can't take any pictures. So finally, I pleaded with them. Look, come on, you, you know, I've been with you that long. Let me do some pictures. And they let me do those on the bus. But then that was it. And now they've put a condition on me. Any stuff that I do behind the scenes, they'll let me do. But I cannot give that to Time magazine, which is kind of awkward because I work for Time. And <laughs> They pay, for, they pay for the bill, the plane fare. I mean, I'm, I'm an independent photographer, but that's who I'm on assignment for. So it's a... Uh, security like? Do you have your camera bags checked by? Well, what was nice about the time, they have Secret Service, and but the thing is, I was given what's called a Secret Service, a staff pin. I was pinned as a, like a staff photographer, which they've since taken that away from me in the last few weeks. Is that a miracle? That last one? <laughs> was that a Sarah Palin miracle? One back. Uh, <laughs> look, this was a yeah, Palin. I'll show some Palin He's ones here in a here. second. Yeah. <laughs> he, his whole dynamic changed, too. He was, his shoulders were always kind of slumped down. He spoke. His whole mood and everything has completely changed once Palin. Uh, it's like she, it also energized her. This is them on the plane, also with Schmidt. You mean energized him? He's a energized he, him. He, he got really energized about having her, just because he saw the energy that she brought to the campaign. This is these are his two sons, both in the military. Jimmy's the first one, and then Jack. Jimmy was a, a marine, or is a marine, and was in Iraq. Here, let's do this here real quick, sorry. Anybody got a quick question while he's looking for uh, more pictures? You said, you said you were like family. Did you feel a little uncomfortable? Well, yeah, I do, a little bit, because the reason in, I was a conflict photographer for my whole career. I had never worked domestically in America. And in 2000, my daughter, my, my first daughter was two years old, and I told Time, look, I don't want Chechnya, I don't want to do it anymore. They assigned me to John McCain in 2000. And I spent maybe six, seven months traveling with them. And they were just like really good people. They were friendly. They, and it's like they, being embedded. Yeah, <laughs> and they, it just became really, really close with them. And uh, so when the new campaign kind of started up, that's, uh, you know, they basically became like a family friend, but it didn't, I try not to let it skew what I did photographically. You know, I'm a photographer, but it, it is, I need to kind of, it is, it is an awkward balance, but uh, to be able to get these pictures, no media, they're gonna allow anywhere near this woman, especially, she's in a hockey shirt, you know, <laughs> feeding uh, hockey. Yeah. You don't think that was intentional, though? What, for the photo? No, no, because there's no, I was on, I wasn't supposed to be on the bus. She changed, uh, she changed, I think I showed a picture that was a, uh, that, that was her announcement speech. This is in the shower of the bus. Um, they were, they did like a four hour bus ride and for two hours I wasn't on the bus and I really pleaded, let me on the bus. And I got on the bus and that's what was going on the bus and I just kind of sit back there. It's, um, <laughs> Otherwise, there would be more pictures of that. There would be more media. This is what the media sees. This is them getting off. This is kind of like everything in the campaign is very staged and controlled uh, of what they want you to see. The problem is with behind the scenes stuff, that is not what the campaign really wants to show because they don't really have control over that. 
the, the, these are the more like staged. Is that fellow Schmidt coming uh, from Carl He's a Cheney. He's a Cheney guy. guy. He worked for for Cheney. She's an active campaigner. Um, the really strange mix was when Palin showed up, the whole dynamics between her and Palin and her husband, it really changed because when she used to come on stage, she used to get a lot of attention and all of a sudden nobody, there was no attention for her and just the whole, the dynamics of, of that was kind of interesting. <coughs> Did you hear that? I yeah, I heard that. How much of it? Um, to be honest with you, a lot the stage stuff is, but a lot of this stuff is not because there's really not a lot of press there. So, like this is backstage at the convention. There's no. This is performing for the camera. This is the, you know, this was at the convention. That's that's a performance, but. Uh, I don't know, she's yeah. driven, you know. Um. <laughs> As an insider, were you, I mean, I, we were in the middle of nowhere and came back to sort of civilization and flipped on CNN and heard that. We were in that. Canada. <laughs> Which is not the middle of nowhere. Hey, 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 hey. 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 We have elections going on too, so you don't have to pay attention to that. Um, no, but we came back and we, we heard that, that Sarah Palin had been nominated by, as the vice president candidate, and we just, jaws dropped. I mean. As having been an insider for all that time, were you? I, and as even shocked? even her inner, even the inner staff, his handlers. I mean, they were a bit shocked, and I could see that they were concerned. The first few days, some of them even asked me. Some that are very high up, you know, like, do you think we made the right decision, or what was my opinion about it? Which, you know, I'm a photographer. They were, they really. To them, it was like way out there. Let's try this. We're going to lose. To them, they're going to lose the election. They were so, like I said, they couldn't get the country excited about them. What are we going to do to cause some excitement? You know, we're going to pick Lieberman. We're going to pick Mitt Romney, another old white guy or something. And I think that Schmidt and some other ones says, look, we need to get this Christian mom with some kids. They knew the daughter was pregnant. They didn't, they did not know that she wasn't pregnant. Um, let's bring her out there on stage. There's nothing, you know, we've had the debate tomorrow. How is, you know, how is a man going to go after this? Because even where I live with my wife in Florida, the, our neighbors, they're all like, oh, have you met Sarah Palin? She's great. They're all like the, the common American. They're like, you know, for some reason, they're just so taken with this woman that she's up there with her baby you know, her handicapped child, and uh, it's like a ploy. There's a... Uh, well, let's think, bring you guys. Let's yeah, bring Stryker and Harry in. No, 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 that's fine. Great. I think what Sorry. this is really... No, it's very insightful because you you saw the effects of the choice that they that the McCain campaign made at a certain point, and what it was was, as Chris says, that somebody went up to McCain and said, look, you're going to lose unless we do something really dramatic. And what they basically, this happens in campaigns a lot. The professionals at a certain point will say to the candidate, look, let us run this show. You want to win? You're not going to win if we keep doing what we're doing. If you keep hanging out with the press, convivial, friendly, chatty, uh, straight talk express, uh, it's not going to work. And Chris saw the kind of, you know, he saw the end result of this. Palin was brought in, basically, it's like throwing a grenade into a pool of water. And it worked for about two weeks. It worked really, really well. And, and I'm sure you must have felt this, but it, it sucked all the oxygen out of the campaign. And suddenly, for two weeks in America, you couldn't see anything on television in the papers or hear anything on the radio that was about anything other than Sarah Palin. Then, I mean, at some point that might have run out anyway, but 
then what happened is huge financial crisis and that changed the dynamic as as strongly as powerfully as as Sarah Palin had changed the dynamic suddenly it's all about seriousness end of the world not Palin's kind of end of the world but financial <laughs> end of the world uh, and so suddenly it's all about seriousness and she doesn't fit into the equation as well anymore as she did she's dropped she hasn't dropped out of sight uh, but what she has done uh, actually hasn't helped her recently. I'm sure you've all seen the, the clips on YouTube and elsewhere of her interview with Katie Couric of CBS. Things have been going badly for her. Uh, tomorrow night, who knows? I mean, the fact is, you know, she didn't really come from nowhere. I mean, it seems like she came from nowhere, but uh, somebody was saying earlier, you know, she did, when she was running for governor, she did 12 debates she actually performed quite well you know she's she's clearly not stupid she is charismatic in the lower C kind of way not the evangelical well she actually might be that too uh, according to what some people say but you know she's she is a good politician and, and what she lacks is the kind of resume that people now with the with their world seemingly collapsing she lacks the resume uh, that you might want to have today. And this is really hurting McCain. McCain himself is stumbling. Uh, Barack Obama has maintained this kind of serenity. A lot of people want him, want to hear him talk the way he used to earlier in the year. They want to hear him rally crowds. He's decided to be quite serene and calm about things. Uh, I think for a number of reasons. First of all, he believes that, frankly, as a as a black man in America, he he has to kind of tone it down a little bit for uh, for voters who might not come to him otherwise. But uh, you know, he's he's go done that, and it's over the last week or so uh, he's really pulling out in the polls, and uh, I don't know what sort of rabbit. Steve Schmidt is going to pull out of his hat, but right now it looks like the Sarah Palin thing is is playing against McCain and not in his favor. Uh, you know, we've got how many? Forty days, more or less, to go. Uh, so we've got a lot of time. A lot of things can happen. I mean, the August surprise was Sarah Palin. The September surprise was Wall Street. There's still October. You know, um, and God knows what's going to happen. But let's, uh, but let's, that's, let's bring yeah, in Harriet. And then exactly. I'd actually, I want to ask um, before he slips out of here. I want to ask Rory Bremner a serious question about the injection of humor and viral videos in the process. What he thinks all of the very good send-ups of Tina Fey by Tina Fey, mm. the comedian, might be doing <coughs> to the reputation of of Sarah Palin in the campaign, whether he thinks, based on what he's observed here and there, it really does resonate beyond just sort of the elite that kind of go on and look at these things. So, I think I'm always quite close. Let's to hold on, just one second. We'll just get you, and then we'll come back to Harry. Before you slip out, I'd just love to hear your view on this. Hold on. I'm always quite close. Oh, no, we want to we want to hear you loud and clear here. All right. Yeah. That's good. You have to remember, I think it was Peter Cook uh, talking about the power of satire, who said you only have to look at the uh, the uh, wonderful job that uh, satire in Germany in the 1930s did to prevent the rise of Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that there are only limits. I think you can you can influence perception in some way, but I think with somebody like Sarah Palin, it's hard to be more satirical than the real thing. It's like trying to be more satirical than the Fox News in a way. <laughs> you know, she in her own way is is such a caricature. Um, Sarah Palin. I mean, she's she's very easy to caricature. Thank goodness. I mean, in, in this country, we're having we're having a bit of a character crunch at the moment, <laughs> where nobody's prepared to lend their personality to anybody else for satirical purposes. So that's why somebody like Boris Johnson is the equivalent of a seven hundred billion seven hundred billion dollar cash injection. Um, <laughs> but um, 
I don't know. I mean, I think people people relate, as uh, Stryker was saying, about being a good politician. Uh, it's interesting that you call her a good good politician because she's not a good politician in the historical sense of somebody who's got a command of the issues, but in the Tony Blair sense of somebody who has charisma and works on a stage. Um, and I think we're going to see that sort of unravel a little bit. Uh, you know, that derivative is going to unwind. Unless, <laughs> unless she against, again, all the expectations tomorrow night, yeah. performs very well. And the Democrats, if you go to the websites, are already playing down expectations. She's a formidable debater. She's really going to be tough for Biden. We shouldn't anticipate any kind of easy victory over her. They're no, that's going to be riveting viewing, isn't it? I mean, that's the thing. And, uh, there was a rumor, I don't know if anyone else heard it, a few weeks ago that they were saying, well, maybe Biden is going to be, he's going to step down. But I don't know if that was something that was put out by Republicans to kind of undermine the uh, the Democrat campaign. But um, I don't know, I haven't been watching much of this. In fact, I can't wait to get home to do the YouTube Katie Couric uh, thing, because I haven't yet seen that interview. But um, Harriet, was it, or was it, no, it was, uh, Chris, your wife was saying that you've got to do it in the right order. You've got to watch the original Katie Couric yes. and Sarah Palin before you watch the satirical one, because otherwise right. you'll get them confused. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't know. But I mean, uh, it is it is exciting. It is it is a, a riveting thing. But I think Strike has been, from my perspective, right on the nail that uh, the credit crunch uh, September has has kind of wiped it off the map. I mean, what's she got to say about the uh, financial crisis and uh, and all that stuff? Thank you, Harriet. Thank you. Well, I mean, I think, you know, we all actually really hope that Sarah Palin unravels. I mean, my fear is that actually she may not. Um, I mean, I think that um, Sarah Palin has already served part of her purpose, which you're right, Striker, that there was a, you know, there was a kind of two-week Palin mania in America. Um, and actually, if you go back to before McCain announced Palin as his... Um, running mate, you know, it, it was, um, uh, you know, Obama had done this uh, kind of extraordinary tour and had addressed 200,000 people in Berlin, which I know didn't play very well at home, but played very well globally. You know, he'd come back, he'd had this kind of uh, um, successful convention. Um, he'd made this extraordinary acceptance speech in Denver, um, again, a kind of massive crowd at the football stadium. And the next morning, uh, McCain announced Palin as his VP pick, and you know the uh, media attention went whoosh, like that. Um, and he gave, she gave McCain a two-week window to claw back um, his campaign, which I think was in quite serious trouble then. Now, I mean, yes, I don't know what the future um, path this campaign is going to take, and anyone I think who is sort of going to make big predictions about what's going to happen over the next 40 days and what's going to happen on November the 4th is a very brave or very misguided person because I think, you know, it's, it, we really kind of can't see how it's going to play out and what the outcome's going to be. But it may be that she has served her purpose. I think then obviously, you know, actually the Republicans were doing quite well in the polls. The economic crisis, um, uh, you know, kind of um, zoomed in from, well, I won't say from nowhere, but, you know, I mean, it zoomed in very suddenly. And that's had a very... Um, I think that I think McCain's played that quite badly, um, but you know, going back to the kind of Palin phenomena, um, I think that she may well um, be quite. I think actually the vice presidential debate tomorrow night might be quite dull, um, which actually is very good for the Republicans. That it might be sort of slightly disappointing because we all hope that somehow she's going to trip up, she's going to make some terrible gaffe, that somehow Biden is going to kind of, you know, uh, be like an attack dog and that's going to play very badly or is going to kind of screw up in some way. You know, actually, it would probably be quite boring. How quite will routine. Biden play this, do you think? Well, I think it's very difficult. And obviously, he's been rehearsing <coughs> quite carefully. Um, you know, he's been uh, closeted with, um, I can't remember her name, a, uh, a woman governor yeah. um, who has been kind of um, up against him in the pain and roll. Um, you know, he's got to be, he's got to be, careful not to be overbearing he obviously doesn't want to be patronizing um, you know it's going to be a very very path a difficult path for him to follow and you know Biden is you know is not risk-free himself um, so you know it has potential to be an extraordinary um, event uh, you know where both parties can kind of make gas but it also has the potential that they've been so well schooled and they're both 
so restrained that actually it might be kind of terribly disappointing. <laughs> There's a question right there, several questions actually right away. I'll, 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 I think just, just, I've got to zoom out. Just one Can very you quick. Do Joe Biden? No, no, I can't do Joe Biden. Can but you do just very quick. No, no, just, <laughs> just very quickly. Just on the subject of the debates, there's a very good article by James Fallows. You probably know him. He writes in The Atlantic. Um, and in this month's or September's edition, he's done a big article called Rhetorical Questions. And it looks at Obama's debating style and McCain's debating style and dissects it. He's, he's, he's looked at all, something like all 64 of the primary debates. He said something that no ordinary human or sane human should ever do. But he's done it. So if you're interested in the whole debating style and stuff like that, it's a really, really good article. It's in The Atlantic. Conclude? James what Fallows, the rhetorical uh, rhetorical questions he calls what it. What does he conclude? Uh, well, the, essentially that the, the he thinks that Obama should go back to how he was in uh, the debates earlier in his career when he was much, he was able to be much looser, much freer. But I, I think once you're in a presidential race, obviously you tense up, just what Chris was what, saying about what McCain tensing up. The closer they get to November, mm. they get so protective. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of every little slip up that, that they, they don't allow the candidates to be themselves. But that's because, you know, it's, it's, it, for each candidate, it's, it's, their, it's their campaign to lose, isn't it? I mean, actually, yes. it's much more likely that it will, to be honest, they, the, the outcome will be as a result of negatives rather than positives. Early on, I was actually assigned to Hillary Clinton in Iowa, and I have never seen a candidate that was so insulated and so, they felt that they had won, that it was hers, the nominated, it was like she was ordained. Mm. So for 30 days, I covered her, and every event looked exactly the same. They would not... They would not let you deviate the what you saw from what the campaign wanted on message, on message. No access. Even if you went into a church, it was a blue background, blue background with American flags. Every event, every day was exactly the same. They did not want to have that way there's nothing off message. Well we've never And then it changed because then they realized she got hammered and but then it was too late. But we've never had a campaign where a mobile phone video of a fundraiser of someone like Obama in what appeared to be a closed session would suddenly become a viral video and, and move through the internet and suddenly make, turn into a major campaign issue as happened with Obama in his bitter, mm. his bitter comment and has happened with Bill Clinton when he was the same woman who was on was the this? off the bus mm. uh, project as part of the Huffington Post, which I recommend to you if you haven't caught up with it, because it has great links to all these videos that we're talking about. So we've never had any election even approaching this, where everything you say is potentially going to move somewhere because of a mobile phone. And that's something. why the Steve Schmitz and whoever Obama's people are, they need to protect them and keep them insulated so there are no slip-ups. It's too, there's too much at risk. Because McCain's freewheeling personality would play to that. Here's, you, you had your hand up. And Sorry. Could you identify yourself? If, yeah, sorry, you hold on just a second. My name's Jonathan Brinson. I didn't have any media affiliations. So, um, Tell us if you're running the Republican <laughs> or Democratic <laughs> campaign. Well, I, I had to, <laughs> two points uh, around the US media and their equivalent of the broadsheet newspapers. And it was something you were saying about Time magazine. And it does seem to me, anyway, it was rather superficially, that there is a bias towards Obama, and he has been given an easier ride through the campaign than uh, McCain has. And the other points I find quite fascinating when reading um, about them on the internet isn't so much the articles as the comments, uh, you know, when people respond underneath. And, and compared to in the UK, where there is a kind of doom and gloom approach to politics, you know, the incumbents versus God knows, you know, David Cameron and the PR machine next, there is such a vitriol between the sort of red and blue states that I just, you know, it's amazing as an outsider to watch the mudslinging between people on these comments pages about the articles. Mm -hmm. And is there a sense of that there are two Americas and can they live, you know, side by side with each other? Do you want to talk about that? Um, well, I think there are two Americas. I mean, I don't think anyone would deny that. And I think we've seen that in both the 2000 and for election in the 2000 election, and I think that it's quite interesting because uh, there is a very, I mean, you're right that this is something that has been said quite frequently about there is a media bias in favor of Obama. I think that most of the media you're talking about is the East Coast and the West Coast media. Um, and, you know, there's a huge amount of America in between. And one of the interesting things that I think, I mean, you know, 
I'm the only one sitting up here who's who's a Brit and who's kind of looking at it from a kind of British media perspective. But I think one of the things that the British media tends to do is concentrate on those kind of um, you know liberal small L um, uh, uh, coasts of America and actually not spend much time at big swathe in the middle that actually will decide the election. And one of the things that we decided to do in The Guardian this, this time around is um, actually base ourselves in a kind of, you know, town in a swing state in the middle um, for three weeks to try and get under the skin of the election. Um, so, um, you know, I think actually if you look at the, you know, you're talking about, when you talk about the media, you're talking about the New York Times or the LA Times. Um, if you look at um, the media that most Americans consume, which is their mm -hmm. local city newspaper, I don't think that there is a kind of um, a, a liberal bias there. Yeah, I, well, I think that's true. I think um, the other thing is is that you know both McCain and Obama are, are actually really good stories. Their life stories are quite good, but but for. Uh, for the post, for the baby boom generation of Americans, which will include a lot of sort of senior journalists and editors and so forth, Obama's story is actually even more appealing uh, because these are people who grew up in the civil rights movement in the United States. For them, the election of Obama would 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 validate a lot of of the ideals that they had at that time. Many of them would have been quite active. Uh, in that time period, and I think that that because Obama is newer on the scene and because his story is such a terrific story, uh, that there is more excitement about uh, about uh, his his campaign among journalists in the United States. But I also think, uh, as as Harriet knows, the um, Journalism in the United States, the broadsheet journalism, Main Street journalism, is quite self-analytical. And actually, I think, from what I know, uh, certainly at Newsweek, and I would expect the same to be true of Time, uh, is quite careful about not looking like favoring one one candidate or or the other. Um, but I do think that there's probably a certain there's cer a certain enthusiasm for the, for Obama that does that does come through one way or the other. Have you had the same difficulties as Time in terms of access? Oh, it's this is I mean what Chris Chris was Chris was like the last one out, you know. I mean he was the first one in and the last one out because uh, they let him stay a little bit longer. We're only talking a matter of days, probably, uh, to others. But everybody was part of this, you know, this McCain, uh, straight talk express, warm, friendly thing that was going on. It was shut down. Basically, it was shut down on the Wednesday or Thursday of the week of the Democratic National Convention. In other words, one or two days before Sarah Palin. That was when they decided we have to be different. Is that it was like night and day. It's yeah. like I, I would get off, get out of the vehicle, I'd walk backstage, walk into the room, always able to take photo. No, never once in a year and a half did anybody say you can't take this picture. And then all of a sudden, one day they were like, "No, don't do, don't take this picture." It was just like uh, night and day. But I know that they became really furious at the New York Times, especially in Time Magazine. Um, some of the headlines, like in Time, one was like, "Why is John? Why is John McCain now a liar?" or something like that. That was like the headline in the magazine. And then they see they they felt like they mm. that they're fawning over Obama. And I know that the senator himself was so personally hurt by Time because in the crowd, when people hand stuff to sign, be it a baseball or a mm. poster, they usually have a Time or Newsweek with the cover, and the candidate will always sign it. When the Time magazine came out. He would not even shake their hand. He would just kind of walk. Mm -hmm. He would ignore them. He was so angry. And prior to Palin, they really needed the media. Schmidt needed and used the media. When Palin was interjected in, it's almost like the alpha male thing. We don't need you anymore. <laughs> it was like, basically it was like that. It was like, F you, we don't need you anymore.
where prior to Palin, they were still constantly trying to, you know, give us some press, give us some press, give us some press. <coughs> After Palin, we don't want you anymore. There was a picture of so. the uh, New York Times columnist Maureen Dowd, mm. who was also thrown off the uh, campaign plane uh, without any explanation other than there's no room for you in the plane. There was a question back there, comment. Hi, my name is Hugh Williamson. I work for the Financial Times. Um, I had a question on how important the uh, international media coverage of the two candidates is for the candidates and for their campaigns. How do they see that? Is it important, completely unimportant? Is it, does it vary between the campaigns? I can't And secondly, well, secondly well, just well. quickly, how are international, the non-US press handled by the two campaigns and do they they, they definitely don't want to give them too much access because the candidate's time is so tight. They don't even, they're focused more on the local TV station, the local, those, that's what their value. When they travel to, to Des Moines or somewhere up in Ohio, they don't care about even the, the Katie Kirks or the big American journalists. They want to find who's the local writer, who's the local TV station, and they want to give them access. They also know that they're going to be, you know, fav you know, they're going to write nice pieces about them. So that's where, so when it says, when somebody comes on and says, look, I'm from an uh, Italian magazine or a French magazine or something, they really, it's going to be very difficult for them to get access. They just have to kind of cover the whole machinery as, as it moves around. Yeah, I that's think that's right. I, mean, I think it's very difficult to get access. and. Um uh, I mean, I think, in ter I think the international media coverage doesn't really matter very much. I mean, um, you know, as, as Chris says, what they're really keen on is the kind of very local media that's um, going to be sort of quite um, positive, quite, um, in, uh, you know, talking quite flattering terms. I mean, I know that when we, when Obama came to, uh, well, did his sort of, uh, you know, global tour, came to Europe, um, mm. we, um, we sort of uh, blanched a bit at the, I think it was $25,000. Um, that the Obama campaign wanted to charge for uh, press to accompany him, but we thought, okay, this is kind of quite important. We'll stump up the money, and then, of course, you know, there was not a single non-U.S. <laughs> journalist was allowed on the trip with him. Um, so it's quite hard to kind of get in. And I mean, you know, I'm already thinking in terms of that last kind of couple of weeks in the run-up to November the fourth. You know, how we're going to kind of be on the campaign trail, and it's kind of a, a it's prohibitively expensive to be inside the bubble, and B, it's practically impossible to get a place inside the bubble. So you just think, well, okay, we'll find out ways of doing it. But I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's just not, it's not a big, um, a big deal for either campaign, I think, to have uh, non-US media uh, with them. And again, you know, it's a reminder that we're down to six or seven battleground states that will determine the election mm -hmm. in terms of the number of electoral votes. And also, if it's again sign of the times, if you go onto the websites Today, you will see a McCain interview, not with a broadcaster, but with the Des Moines Register newspaper that has been recorded and put on a website and picked up, in which you see a very testy McCain taking issue with a question about, about Sarah Palin and about a campaign ad um, about Obama. And he was very aggressive about it, but they had it on video and they put it on on their website. I mean, the daily schedule of the candidate, every city they go to is scheduled in the morning, usually 6.30, 7 in the morning they start and it's all local interview, local interview, local interview, and then boom, then they're out. There's no national, but even with Palin though, I don't even, I think they kept her away even from the local mm -hmm. interviews because they were afraid mm -hmm. of uh, some slip up. Mm -hmm. And as you notice, the pictures when I was on the back of the bus that first day with with Palin, who was sitting next to Palin at all times is Steve Schmidt. It's when, and when she would leave McCain to fly to Alaska to get her clothes and to repack to come out, who flew with Palin all the way to Alaska? Steve Schmidt. It's, you know, I've got to train her, I've got to coach her. And then if you see these Katie Couric interviews, it's almost like she's she's thinking about what she wants to say, but then she's thinking about what she was told to say. And it almost looks like she's tongue twisted. Paralyzed, yeah. She's paralyzed because mm -hmm. she knows that I have to stay on, and it just comes off looking off. In fact, when you look at like the, um, the well, the latest one that I've seen, which is um, when Katie Couric asked her about which newspaper she 
has read, what informs her about her worldview. And uh, Palin says, um, well, you know, I read them all. And three times, Katie Couric comes back and says, yeah, which you know, what specifically you do you read? Specific? And she doesn't answer. And that, that clearly is the kind of sort of mental paralysis that she's in her head. You know, she's thinking, oh, God, you know, if I say anything, it's going to kind of play badly. Because, I mean, it's not a difficult question to answer. Yeah. <laughs> Which paper you read? The other thing about gaffes is, and, and uh, they might the campaign, the, official, the officials of the Obama campaign would be very wary of using, of using uh, uh, any sort of negative Sarah Palin incident because it could work against them. But these gaffes, as Chris was saying, and as John was saying, you, when you get to this point in the campaign, it's a half a dozen states that matter. In each state, it's a couple hundred thousand votes. And you not only have the viral videos and, and the internet and all of that, but you have, you have advertising on television and radio in the United States in, in huge quantities. I mean, it, it, it begins to drive you crazy if you're back there because it's so much. And so what happens is if they pick something up, that will be turned into an advertisement in a matter of hours. And it can be out on hundreds of television stations on, in all these battleground states. I mean, you got to remember they're going to be they will have spent three billion dollars on the campaigns this year. It's funny how quickly it reacts. It's uh, I've been with McCain and we'll be flying somewhere and you, I see what the staff schedule is, and all of a sudden when we land, we're whisked into a back room at a air terminal and he sat down to record a commercial and it's in response to something that happened while he was, while he was in the air that Obama, they realized, okay, we got to get this mm -hmm. out and then the next day it's an ad on TV. They, they really respond very quickly to anything that the other candidate uh, says. A couple of questions, one right here, your hand was up first, just one second, and then I think there was a, did you have a question there, Rosalind, and then <coughs> the back, because right here. Thank you. I'm Fiona Campbell from Radio Netherlands uh, Worldwide. A question for Chris. I was interested in the photographs, the behind the scenes with Bush, um, with McCain, McCain. and um, with Palin. What kind of um, issues were they talking about? And if he does get into the White House, how can they reconcile they, their, their, their uh, black and white approach. I didn't really hear much and I'm, because of the behind the scenes access I really can't say what they're talking about but I think most of it was about what how it's going to play out in the media what what are they going to say about this uh, you know it was kind of like it was kind of along those lines and uh, yeah. And the second part was there any what was the. If he does get in. How will they reconcile their black and white approach to many issues? Oh, I have no idea. I have no idea. I personally don't think that they'll win. I really don't. Uh, I can't see it, but uh, I didn't see it in 2000. I didn't see it in 2004. So if McCain <laughs> wins, I mean, they come to you and ask you to be the official no, I, I would never, White House photographer? No, 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 no. I would never be a, because then you're, 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 no longer, you're not a journalist anymore, you're a government employee. I would never. Uh, Who did that with the Ford administration? Very prominent. Kinnerly. That's David Kuhn oh, Kinnerly. Yeah. Did that hurt his uh, career? Or? I, I don't know if it hurt it, but. Uh, that's a good question. I don't think it did particularly. No. No. But it's kind of like then you work for the U.S. government, and I really don't want to be labeled a Republican photographer. I enjoy covering the Bush administration, but as a journalist, I would never want to, you know, I don't know, it's an odd role to be in. Plus, you got to wear a tie. I mean, even now, what you <laughs> mean, yeah. but even now with what you do, it's like, you know, and I tell the people when, you know, I'm here to help your guy get elected. You know, it's kind of like I'm part of the propaganda machine. Even though I'm media, I'm, as a visual historian, I'm there to make your candidate look good. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a, an odd role. Hi, Rosalind Bain, uh, freelancer. Um, I'm struck by the conversation has been almost entirely about personality. 
are there any issues involved in the election? Will anything be decided on issues? Or is it literally whether people prefer Sarah Palin and the fact she's a hockey mum, et cetera? Is that where we're at? But, I, but personally on that, I think it's the popularity of Obama. I think it's not over issues either. It's like a celebrity. It's, uh, it's this cult of personality. It's this fascination with something. It's not about <coughs> the issues. That's why when you in, have this interview with Palin, she can't answer. It's all this kind of like doublespeak because it's kind of not for me. Mm. But also we did just, I think we just all agreed that the financial crisis mm. has changed everything. Mm. That's an issue. In what way? In what way? What are the issues that are coming out? Well, the issues, I mean, this is, it's changed it in that it's totally knocked them off their own sort of track because they now, they're not sure how to respond. That's why you've seen over the last 10 days or so quite a lot of equivocation on the part of, of both Obama, who I think handled it better, and McCain, who handled it less well because they, they're, they're feeling the same pressures they are senators, after all, as the senators and congressmen and congresswomen in Washington. They're the people, the voters, on the one hand, are, are angry and don't want them to vote for a bailout for Wall Street, but the, the establishment, the political establishment in Washington is saying, but we've got to do this or the whole thing is going to crash. And so it has gotten really serious, and, and they can't escape these economic issues. And it did come up, I don't know whether you watched the debate last Thursday or Friday, I guess it was. Um, you know, it did, it did come up in that debate. I mean, the, the McCain and Obama were asked, what are you going to do with your spending plans? if you don't have as much money as you used to. Now, they didn't, they didn't give you a, a, the kind of answer you probably would like, but it has gotten serious. And there are, you know, there are, there are issues. The problem is, you're absolutely right, the focus, especially when somebody like Sarah Palin comes along, is suddenly 100% about personality and almost 0% about, about issues. And as Stryker points out, we still have big foreign policy potential conflicts and issues looming in October. So, Harriet. I think that's right. I mean, I think what you say, that the economy is going to be the kind of decisive issue um, in this election. I mean, th there's, there's two things. I mean, firstly, it's sort of um, surprising, or perhaps not, but slightly depressing that uh, the, the kind of the issue of Iraq has, is kind of nowhere on the radar it seems to me, um, which, you know, given the fact that it's been such a dominant feature of the Bush administration, um, you think that would play um, more um, strongly in voters' minds, but it doesn't seem to be playing at all or, or kind of very low down the list. But the second thing is about what you say about personality politics. I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of truth in that, that I think people do um, pay more attention to personality issues than policy issues, and I don't think that's um, confined to America. I mean, I think you can see that in this country, too, where, you know, there's a, the, the whole of the UK seems to be kind of, you know, dismissive of, of Brown and Labour and kind of in love with Cameron, and then that's really on the basis of, you know, he's kind of younger and a bit fresher and a bit cooler, and, you know, actually, it's not, it, I don't think it's much to do with policy. So, I mean, I think that's, that's a phenomenon that goes beyond America. Now, we're getting a lot of questions, and, I, and let's maybe pose a number of rather, maybe we'll take a, a group of questions here so we can get more in. There was a hand back there, there was your hand, there was your hand, and yours back there. So I think, was there someone there first that had their hand up, or I missed? Okay, then did I miss somebody? You, let's, let's take you on this side, sorry. We need a second microphone. Hi, uh, I'm Ellen Fry. I'm, I'm not a journalist. You talked about the slickness of the Clinton campaign and the sort of sudden slickness of the McCain campaign. And I think an interesting aspect of the Obama campaign is the perception that he's not a politician. But obviously, his campaign is extremely well organized, or he wouldn't be doing as well as he is. And I was wondering what your comments were or perceptions were of how the Obama campaign has been run. OK, let's hold that one. The kind of battle on the ground, the campaign organization versus the media cycle um, issue, which, okay, there's one. You're happy with that? At the very back, and then, and then, um, go ahead. 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, may I ask two questions? No. <laughs> Just one. <laughs> Beyond the obvious about this Palin person, what is it that you find that the people in America find so appealing? Is there, I mean, is there an answer to that kind of a question? I mean, the obvious is, you know, the, her performance, but is there anything else she, that people she, talk she, about? She looks like them. She's like the she's like the lady next door. She's like the woman you see in the grocery store. <coughs> to them, it's like all of a sudden she could be the president of the United States. Well, that's my that's that, that's that, that's the point. Doesn't anybody realize that that could happen? <laughs> <laughs> they just uh, yeah. <laughs> Should we take him as a group? Yeah, well, yeah, well, sorry well, about well, that. well, we already jumped into this one, so now sorry, I think we ought to, out of fairness, we ought to deal with your question because often I know these serious questions and then people forget the question. So, well, the, your question is about the Obama campaign. The Obama campaign, campaign is amazing. I mean, I don't know whether I you haven't, no, I, I mean, haven't been there how many people in this room get emails from the Obama campaign? And, yeah, and texts, exactly. I mean, that. That's just a small indication. We're, uh, I, I don't believe we're in Ohio, you know, or Michigan. We're, this is not a battleground city. Uh, <laughs> Actually, that's true, though, Stryker. I think this is a battleground city. Well, we're all, uh, it, well, it, of course it you is. You mean because of what the, I, uh, because, because there's, de there's Democrats abroad, sorry. Yeah. Because there's Democrats abroad who live in London, and there's not as many Rep Republicans abroad who live in I know, but I think, I think you take my point. I mean, obviously there's oh, a Obviously I take your point, Stryker. No. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> this is not. What I'm saying is that the the campaign is so well organized that it's it's well organized here as well, which is and of course the Republicans are here too, but the the if you look at the Obama campaign, I believe it's the same team that's been <coughs> that's been with him now for uh, you know since the beginning of 2007, and. They're incredibly disciplined. You don't hear about leaks out of that campaign. Uh, they're very, very good. Uh, and that, you know, discipline is a kind of slickness. It's a really well-run campaign, and they have done, they've done a really good job. Do you think there, that is an indicator of whether or not you would be a successful chief executive as a president in terms of how your campaign is managed is there any, do you think, correlation between the competency in which you run a campaign? Well, some people would say yes. I mean, you know, I, I don't, I can't remember. I've read there, are there, like, for Obama, I mean, there are 30,000, 38,000, you know, places in America, the campaign, you know, campaign shops basically <laughs> set up. Um, it, it is like running, uh, it is like running a, a, a an industry, and one of the things that people used to say about uh, John Kerry, did you cover that campaign at all? That campaign was supposedly just a mess. They kept bringing in new people all the time. So, I'm sorry, that's a very long answer, but, but so yes. If, if I can just say, I mean, I think that's absolutely right, and I think that partly explains the, um, when you talked about the serenity of the Obama campaign, and I think that partly explains it is that they really believe that actually what they're doing is they are building the groundwork for a victory on November the 4th. Um, and that's been something that they've been doing for a long time. And that McCain might kind of sweep in and kind of grab the headlines for a day, you know, kind of dominate the media cycle for a day. But actually, what will win the election in the end is getting the vote out, um, you know, making sure that all your supporters are registered. And they have really, really done the heavy lifting on that. And you know, I think that they kind of think that's what will see them mm. through. But we they were clearly we wrong footed by, the They were clearly wrong footed by the Palin selection. Oh, yes. though. you no, could tell for the first time absolutely. they were all over yeah. the place. Yeah. They didn't know how to respond. They, you could just see them kind of bobbing yeah. and but weaving. To get an idea, you travel around the states. I never, prior to Palin, ever saw a McCain sticker on a car ever. Mm -hmm. And now they're everywhere. McCain, Palin, they're in mm -hmm. yards in our neighborhood. So it definitely did something to the mm -hmm. to to try to counter Obama. You had a, your hand up, and then hold on just one second. By the way, my uh, this is a personal disclosure, but Palin's selection has now obscured the only other sort of mocked vice presidential candidate. I'm from a small town 
in Indiana that was the home of Dan Quayle. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have some familiarity with uh, these. Um, I'm a student broadcast journalist at City University. And I think if we look at Obama, he's very accessible to media which attracts young people, entertainment shows, pop shows, this kind of stuff. And I don't think McCain has that same factor with the young people. Do you think he's worried about this? Is this an issue of concern think, for him? Early on, he used yeah, to be he very, used to, uh, he used yeah. to go on MTV. He was very accessible. He has his young daughter, Megan, who is uh, constantly doing stuff for her dad. Um, he's just not, he's not as appealing as Obama. I mean, he's, he's in his 70s, and uh, it's just, uh, he's tried. I just don't but think how he's are, just How worried is he about the youth vote? I think they're very concerned about the youth vote, but there are a lot of young Republicans in America. I'm surprised. <laughs> you know, they're, they're there. One thing on the youth vote, it, uh, Ohio, for example, there are today voting on November 4, or eligible to vote, 750,000 people who were not eligible, eligible to vote in 2004. Now, Ohio was won by a, by a much smaller number than that. So that gives you an idea of why McCain would be worried about it and why Obama would be concentrating on it. By the way, I mean, McCain used to be a regular on this very popular American comedian show, David Letterman, who has now been mocking <coughs> McCain for not turning up on the program yeah. because he had to go solve Washington. So he's been a running series of jokes almost about jo at John McCain's expense. Yes. Hi, I'm Alan Pope, nothing to do with journalism. Did the, uh, the advert that Paris Hilton do, did that have any effect at all in the campaign and does that affect the youngsters? I think it has an effect just by the fact that if it's so kind of out there, it just generates such a buzz that it ends up on all the news programs, it ends up on the late night TV shows, it ends up on YouTube, and they get such a long run with it. You know, just likening Obama to the Antichrist and to, you know, like he's going to part the Red Sea or something. It just creates a certain energy. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, they do that intentionally. What was the McCain ad, though, about that, about, the, about Obama being sort a of celebrity. A celebrity. A celebrity. And, and parting the, the Red Sea and all Yeah, that. but that, now they have Palin. She's a celebrity, so it comes back. Yes. Okay, and then we'll just pick some more and we're... We'll wind we'll go another five plus minutes, then we'll call. Okay. Oh, hold on. She's got the microphone. Sick. Um, Susan Chilman, I'm a photojournalist. Can you Sorry. please speak to the issue of race and, in particular, the concern that it's going to manifest on polling day while having been concealed in the poll? This is a so called Tom Bradley effect name for the mayor of Los Angeles where people mm -hmm. appeared to say they would be voting for yeah. him and then on election day. It has a lot of names. I mean, because it's happened to a lot of blacks. It, there's, it's the Bradley effect. It's the Wilder effect. Governor Wilder of Virginia was supposed to win by, by you know, I can't remember exactly, but let's say six or eight or ten percent, but he barely won. It happened to David Dinkins, who was uh, uh, mayor of New York. Uh, he was supposed to win by a larger number, and he didn't. Um, there, nobody really knows what the effect is going to be, but I think everybody agrees that there will be an effect. And the question is, is it going to be 2 percent or is it going to be 8 percent? Um, there have been a lot of studies done recently. AP, Yahoo News did one. They found that uh, among white Democrats, 33% of them manifested a kind of racial uh, prejudice. Uh, there are surveys, uh, there's sev many studies have been done in the, in the sort of uh, professional areas in business that show that if you get a equally qualified, you know, black man, white man, that the, that the the interviewer, the, the person reviewing the CV or, or the doing the interview, even trying not to be biased will be biased. And it just, it just shows up all the time. But the thing is, we don't know how, how much it's going to show up. Your That's Gary Young has been very yeah. good. Yeah, Gary should be really good. But on Gary's that. been great. I mean, I think you're right. We won't, <coughs> we won't know at all. I mean, I think it will be a factor. And I think that um, 
I think that the thing that is really um, hard to pin down is, um, you know, that we're not talking about kind of out and out racism, people who are kind of openly racist, or even people who say, well, you know, I'm not a racist, but I can't quite bring myself to vote for a black candidate. I think we're talking about people who, in their minds, just sort of somehow say, Obama's a bit different. You know, I don't quite trust him. I'm not quite sure about him. And I think there's a lot of latent racism there that's very hard to get at. Um, but it's just somehow he's not quite one of us. Um, and I think that's what can be very, very, um, you know, it's a very dangerous thing for the Obama campaign and for Obama himself. And I think that, you know, I, well, we'll, we'll, we'll know. I think the McCain kind of people are counting on that. Yeah, They're I think counting on that, that if, yeah. they, if they can stay four points down in these battleground states, they feel that that four points will be made up by this factor. So can you speak just to the move, as you sense it? Yes. No, I don't think, no, I don't think there's a, the Republicans that I meet, it's more of fear about, you know, this kind of like socialist tendencies and taking, you know. And what about the Hillary women? Where do you think they're going to end up at the end of the day? I am. I am Are they? Idea. We don't know, do we, really? I, I don't, I, I found it hard to believe that, that a woman that would have voted for Hillary would vote for Sarah Palin or switch her vote because of Sarah Palin. Be, I mean, I, I can't imagine two people who are more ideologically different. Uh, I don't, but, but uh, they said at the time that that's part of the calculation. That seems to me to, to have been maybe a very small part. The big part of the calculation was the right, the fundamentalist, religious, Republican right. The, that e was the, the evangelicals, yeah. because even in, like I keep talking about, the neighborhood where I live is very Republican, a lot of Christians, a lot of military. They did not like McCain. Florida, in, in Florida. In Florida, they yeah. did not like McCain. They were not, they never talked about the election, and all of a sudden, they've got the signs in their yards, and they, it's like God has given them Sarah Palin. They're very excited about okay, it. Okay, let's get a few more questions. You had your hand up, and then we'll take a couple back here. Well, we got them all over the place. So. You, I think you've had your hand up very faithfully here I for a while. Actually. You haven't? <laughs> I'm sure I saw your hand. Then you did your hand. <coughs> Good, okay. go, you got it. Um, we just talked about the influence of race on the election. I was wondering whether you could speak about the influence of gender on the election, um, both in terms of the fact that you go from Hillary Clinton being a possible presidential candidate and how that impacted um, the primary season and having now Sarah Palin as the vice presidential nominee, perhaps the president, I mean, John McCain's in his 70s, um, and I think it's quite interesting because I, I read a lot of the political blogs online um, to see their change of language. So you have all the Republican blogs who kind of use very sexist language about Hillary Clinton and now they're defending Sarah Palin. And on the other hand, you have all the Democratic blogs who are spreading all these rumors about Sarah Palin, um, bringing up her daughter's baby, et cetera, et cetera. So, I'm very interested to see how Americans Just view um, the possibility of Sarah Palin being in the White House as opposed yeah, to Hillary Clinton. Up front, you can really see it because in McCain events for a year and a half, you saw veterans, older people, hardcore male Republicans, and some elderly women. Now it is packed with lots and lots and lots of young women, and there it's like a rock concert for them. They're all up front. They want to see the woman. They want to touch her, and they're females, and they're every they're young, they're housewives, and I've really, I was amazed that this I think, happened. I think that's true, and I think the other thing um, is that um, I, I think I'm right in saying that the uh, women's vote in America is um, much more likely. To, it, it's much less entrenched either Republican or Democrat, is that right? And also women are much more likely to come out and vote um, than men. So obviously the women's vote is a kind of huge, a hugely important, uh, uh, women are hugely important There are more women. Yeah. Period. Um, I mean, in, but I mean, uh, you know, I, I mean, I agree with what you said, John, is that, I mean, it's very hard to believe that, you know, in terms of kind of 
uh, those hardcore Hillary supporters that they're going to kind of switch to Palin because I mean that actually doesn't kind of credit them with very much intelligence. You know, you kind of you don't have to have very much to kind of see those fundamental differences between them. But I suppose it's that kind of undecided, you know, um, centre ground of of uh, women who kind of identify with a female politician and. You know, we keep saying we don't know how this is going to play out, but I mean, I think that's the kind of remarkable <coughs> thing about this whole campaign and the election itself is that, you know, nobody, nobody does know how all these factors are going to pan out on November the 4th. There were two, just uh, one in front and one behind, and then um, one here, and then we'll, there's one last question, we'll do it, but we're winding down now, okay? Thank you. Yeah, my name is Felicity Spector from Channel 4 News. I was just reading today that um, the Republicans are now back to the position pre-Palin that they were in about worrying about a democratic landslide. I'm just wondering, given the evidence you've, you've seen of, of an energized Republican base, is it energized enough to last the next 40 days? Or are, is it really seriously a case of a wipeout for the Republicans this time? I don't know. I think maybe the economy has this thing that just happened a few yeah. days ago has taken a lot of that. There know. were three. There were three polls out today, in um, one in Florida, one in Pennsylvania, <coughs> and one in Ohio, all of which give Obama a sort of fairly substantial lead, i.e., beyond the um, margin of error. I mean, a, a, a sort of a minimum of eight, nine points, and maybe up to about fifteen points. But I mean, you know, whether that translates to a landslide. Who knows? I mean, most of the polls are putting the, uh, the, the, the each candidate within the mar margin of error, which means that, you know, it's very hard to predict. In the real clear politics website, um, as of today, I think Obama is up five yeah. points, and he leads in every battleground state but um, Missouri over, Ob over uh, McCain right now. You have the next question, and then we'll take one here. Uh, Hassan Ali, a uh, member of uh, Frontline Club. And <clears throat> is the political correct correctness uh, worked the other way around against the Obama, as they have been restricted to use their strengths against the uh, Iraq war or the crunch crunches for being uh, suspected as a, le as a less patriotic? It would be that it would be less patriotic to vote for Obama. But if they, uh, um, f for Obama's side, if they criticize, for example, an um, um, Iraq war, which is could be the cause of the um, economic problem, and being um, criticized as a less patriotic, so that restricted their chances to use their strengths against the uh, um, Republican candidate. I think early on that was the, yeah. the main yeah. tactic of the Republicans was to paint him as unpatriotic, but I think that has since <coughs> gone away. I don't... You remember the, remember the Reverend Jeremiah Wright incident, his pastor at his church in Chicago who had said some things in the past that were deemed to be quite anti-patriotic um, and said, among other things, that 9-11 that America had brought that on itself. Uh, it, that was becoming an issue. Obama took quite a gamble and he made the, the, probably the best speech of the entire campaign of, by anybody in Philadelphia on the issue of race. And since, <coughs> since then it's kind of quieted, race and patriotism, because patriotism was, was part of that. Since then, it's kind of quieted down a little bit. But I think that is, again, one of the, you hear not from the, uh, not from the McCain campaign, but you hear other people in blogs uh, constantly talking about his middle name, which is Hussein, you know. And uh, that's clearly designed to, to somehow raise questions about his patriotism. He, ha he, he did bow to pressure, though, because now there's not a time you see him on TV or on stage without that lapel pin. <laughs> mm -hmm. And for the longest time, he yeah. wasn't wearing it. But and all his ads now, it's cropped. You see that little American flag because they take that very... Uh, he wore it on Friday serious. in the debate, and McCain didn't. McCain didn't have yeah. one. Now. You have the last question. Hold on just one second. Unless I've missed yeah, somebody who's really surprised. Dying 
Thanks, my name is Suzanne Todd. Just a question about leadership. And at the moment, I mean, the systems in America seem to be failing left, right, and center uh, in terms of Wall Street's in crisis, Paulson saying, do this, uh, House Representative Center saying, no thanks. We seem to have a lame duck president, and maybe we'll see what the Senate says. So just at the moment, in the midst of a leadership campaign, who's actually leading America at the moment? I think it's a really good question. I think there's a really big crisis of leadership, actually. I mean, I think if you see Bush on the TV in the past um, few days, he's looked incredibly beleaguered, uncertain, unhappy. Uh, you know, I mean, his, his presidency, which you mm. know, lots of people would say hasn't been particularly glorious, is kind of going down in a kind of you know, tsunami of, of economic catastrophe. Um, uh, I think that also, uh, you know, in terms of Congress, I mean, you have to remember that this is a, an election that's not just about the president, but actually, you know, there are lots of people up for re-election and they're all kind of thinking about their futures and thinking, <coughs> you know, how their, what they behave now might play in their, you know, home states. Um, and I think there, I think there is a, it's, you know, there is a genuine crisis of leadership in the states. <coughs> I think that's right. Uh, I mean, really, I, I mean, it's because it's not just it's not just Washington. I think. I mean, th in fact, you know, Masters of the Universe at one point was actually, I think, like in the '80s, was quite a compliment, right? People on Wall Street. Now, all these people who were seen as who were running giant corporations, making you know scores of millions of dollars every year and so forth, they are now. Um, uh, they're now in, you know, they're now in, uh, in disgrace, and uh, so yes, I think there is a crisis, and I think it's sort of leadership versus fear is what's going on in America right now. Chris, we're going to give the last word to you. You started us out on your photographs. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> Oh, it's just, it's fascinating to see what's going. This whole thing with fear in the country is: are they going to choose McCain, Palin, or are they going to choose Obama? To me, it's like, you know, I'm close to the McCains. I I can't see how that could happen, but it very well could happen. McCain, Palin. We'll see. Well, um, you've been a great audience. Thank you for uh, persevering in spite of the absence of Jon Snow and James Nocte. You did get a bonus, though, with Roy Bremner. <laughs> so we, we're, we're not completely ignorant here at the Frontline Club. We got him up here to do a, a few minutes for you. So thank you for coming along. See you next time. Thank you.